All right, so what did we say? What's the uh, purpose of converting between postfix and prefix? What does it allow us to more easily do? As in, what did you just write on your piece of paper? Gets the right order. Yeah, I think you're probably right, but tell me, tell me what you actually mean. Yeah, it 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 uh, helps do maintain order order of operation for math, right? Yeah. All right, so it puts us in a situation where we can algorithmically do do order of operation. Does that mean it's impossible to do it otherwise? No, but it would be substantially more difficult to go through, and you almost have to like look ahead and figure out what's coming, and then decide when do I hold off on doing math and when do I not. So it, it makes it substantially more difficult. Um, okay, so and I also I posted on Slack. Uh, so just as a heads up to scare you a little bit. Your homework assignment over the weekend is going to be on something called balloon filters. We're going to be talking about that here in a few minutes. Uh, if you uh, sign up and attend the hackathon, uh, I put the link back up there, uh, you can skip this assignment and get it on a Mac 100. Otherwise, if you don't want to go to the hackathon, which is a 9 to 5 commitment, then you can uh, just do the homework. Up to you. So it's not a, it's not a uh, ultimatum. Just a, a slight bribe, I suppose. All right, so pick your poison. But hopefully just the name of this scares you. All right, so uh, let's finish up our, um, uh, let's see, our get answer. So just to refresh kind of where we left off. Um, as long as our input queue still has stuff in it, We'll grab the current symbol, current element from the input queue. We'll ask if it's an operator. If it's an operator and it's an open parenthesis, we'll just add it to our uh, op stack. If it's a closing parenthesis, we want to uh, um, keep going as long as our op stack is not empty, even though technically what we're really saying is, is keep going until we finally burn past the corresponding uh, opening parenthesis, right? But we know that this will never actually occur. Um, so we'll break out as soon as we hit this guy. So we could have just as easily just said while true here, just made it an infinite loop. Um, we'll grab the cur op from the, uh, uh, the op stack. So we'll pop it from the op stack. We'll ask, are you an opening parenthesis? Because if it's an opening parenthesis, we don't want to migrate it to our output stack or output queue rather. Um, so if it's the opening parenthesis, we'll break out. We've effectively cleaned our, uh, our op stack to the appropriate level. Um, otherwise, we'll just keep uh, adding to the end of our output queue the op we just popped off of our op, op stack. Make sense? Else if it's a power, we're just going to go ahead and push this onto our op stack. It's not necessarily, I think last time uh, um, Brian said that we always just add it, and that's true in our case. True in our case because of the operators we're dealing with. But if you did have operators that were more powerful than th this, then we would have to uh, deal with this accordingly. But um, uh, this guy, because it's uh, right, uh, what is it called, right justified or whatever for the those things, it will just go on to our stack in our case. Okay. Otherwise, if we're a normal operator, uh, let's do our normal operator thing. So that means we will try to add this to the op stack over and over until it finally fits. So we're going to go ahead and uh, start uh, start here. Um, all right. So what does it mean if we're dealing with a normal operator for it to uh, fit on the stack? So if we go back here to our, I'll just bring it up in another thing. So this is shunting yard algorithm. In order for it to fit, it must be. greater than what's already there. All right, so when we tried to put the uh, uh, the minus sign on top of the multiplication, multiplication is more powerful, so we had to pop the multiplication, then we tried to add the minus again. 
there's a tie goes to the runner situation here, so we have to pop the plus sign before we can actually finally add the minus. So we try to add the operator to our stack, um, uh, and we're only successful when the top of the stack is uh, less than the guy we're trying to add. Correct? All right, and do we have a function that gives us, okay, yeah, we have op priority. All right, so we'll say while this dot op stack dot peak, and we're going to take that guy, and we're going to say this dot op priority of that op is less than this dot op priority of what we call it, cur op, cur symbol. Yep, cur symbol. There we go. So while the op priority of the top of our op stack is less than the op priority of our cur symbol, we need to go ahead and pop from our uh, op stack and append it to the end of our output queue. Right? Well, let's, let's see. So it would be less than equal equal to. So when we try to put the minus on top of the, that's not less than or equal to. We tried to put the minus on top of the plus sign. No, it would be less than. Oh, less than or equal to because we're doing the pop in this case. Yeah, you're right. So less than or equal to. Then we'll say this dot output Q dot add last this dot op stack dot pop. We'll do that over and over and over again. When we finally get here, we know that we are now safe to push onto the op stack our current symbol. So this dot op stack dot push her symbol like that all right so now our op stack is in should be in good working order right scroll back up all this stuff was if we're dealing with an operator if we're not dealing with an operator we must be dealing with a number. And what do we do with numbers? We just append them to our output stack, right? So we'll say this dot output queue dot add last cur symbol. Okay. When we're done here, when does this guy end? This guy ends as, as long as, this guy ends when we have finally finished grabbing things from our input queue. So we may still have stuff in our op stack. So now we need to pop until our op stack is empty. Clear the op stack to the output queue while this dot op stack dot so while it's not empty didn't we find last time there's two empties there's an is empty that came from vectors and then there's empty which is a stack function so while this dot op stack dot is not empty then what are we going to do we're going to say this dot output q dot add last this dot op stack dot pop Okay, so now our output queue has all of the elements in the right order. So let's convert it to a string for now, for testing, testing purposes. So we'll say string answer is equal to the empty string 
and we'll say um, for string s in this dot output q answer plus equals s concatenated with maybe a space arrow space something something like that All right that should give us our idea of what's in there and then we'll ultimately return answer okay so let's see if our shunting yard is uh currently this guy's supposed to get the answer but right now it's giving us the uh um uh this the prefix version of our postfix input that's what he should be giving us so we'll go back to main activity uh when we click the shunting yard button we're gonna go ahead and uh uh, call our shunting yard algorithm, passing it whatever's in our input text field, uh, the two-string version of that, and then we'll set the text to that guy's get answer. All right, so let's give this guy the old college try. Get this uh, launching, and we'll go steal our sample from uh, oh, they do theirs in like in terms of A, B, C, and that kind of stuff. Actually, that that shouldn't break ours since we're not doing math right now. It should work just fine. So a a plus b times c minus d. Yeah, we'll go ahead and while that's booting, we'll get that put into a so a plus b times c minus well, we'll leave it like this for right now, and let's give ourselves a second version of this. Four plus two times three minus two. So that should be. 6 plus 4 is 10, minus 2 is 8. So that should ultimately equal 8 if our math ends up working right. So let's go ahead and put in our A plus B, the stuff. What, we can't, we can't paste? Let's see, does this always paste one of these things? Okay. Let me just select this again. One of these guys? No. Oh, this guy probably. No, that cuts it. Did this paste it? Okay. Oh, hold on. I just got a paste, but I get it. But does it let us paste from out here? Is it only within the app? Oh, well. A plus B times C minus D. So we'll run this through our, I click it. Ruh row. Let's see where this guy says it died. Oh, it's complaining about on click, like the button didn't work. We did connect this to our button, right? And this is correct for a button. Returns nothing, names something, takes a view, V as a parameter. Be happy with that. Let's 
just do it back in here real quick. Just for the sake of sanity. I think we did this last time and it was working. Okay, so we got into that code. We'll create our instance of shunting yard first. Make sure that runs. It doesn't crash. Okay. So, so then we're calling get answer. So let's go ahead and trace that because that's clearly where it's dying. So we'll put a break in there. Where's our debugger dude? Or does it just automatically stop there? The little bug guy. Right. A plus B minus C times D. Didn't even get into our. This is a break, isn't it? Yeah, it's a break point. And this guy doesn't take any parameters. We should get to the first line. And let's say string answer is equal to psi dot get answer. And we'll put answer in here. Let's comment this out for a moment. And we'll do a system.out.println answer. Debug this again. It's just weird. Let's see if I can get it to stop there. And just for future run. Okay, so debugger is working, so we need to step into this guy. It gets us there. And we're going 
going to step over. Okay. Current symbol is A. But we just add it to our op queue. Current symbol is a plus. That's one of these guys. He's not of that. He's not of that. He's not of that. So we'll try to add it. Oh, 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 oh. The stack's empty. The output uh, stack, op stack is empty, and we're trying to detect if the peak of it is uh, greater than the thing. So while this dot op stack dot empty so while it's not empty and this is true burn stuff otherwise keep kicking so I should be able to just run this normally now it is weird though that it wouldn't stop there I had to go outside of it to step into it All right, there's our output. A, B plus C, D times. Is that? Minus. Uh, oh, minus times. Is that that's the right output? I don't remember what was in this one. A plus B times C <coughs> minus D. A plus, what was our input on this guy? plus B times C minus D. Okay, so it should be ABC times, blah, 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 ABC times plus D minus. That's not what ours shows. Let's go back and let me put this on their output rather than in the text. Run it again quickly, just to make sure that goes there. And then we'll see where we're zigging when we're supposed to be zagging. All right, so A, B, plus C, D, minus times. All right, so it has to be when we're adding those those guys. So let's go back with that minus equals thing. So if the plus sign, if this guy is empty, we can add it. When we get to the times is we're allowed to add it as long as, let's review that if statement. Okay, so it's not empty and the priority of the peak the priority of the plus sign is less than or equal to the priority of the guy we're trying to add. So plus sign has a priority of two. The multiplication has a priority of um, three. Oh no, that says burn it. We're not supposed to burn it. We're backwards. So it should be greater than. Burn it if it's greater than. A, B, C times D minus plus. Okay. We are not supposed to burn if they are equal, right? So if it's empty, we're just going to add the new guy. Otherwise, we're going to look at the top of 
the op stack, we get its priority, and that guy only gets removed. Let's take it through here. So we only pop if the peak has a priority that is greater than or equal to, right? Because we'll pop the plus sign for the minus sign. So it's greater than or equal to. Now it should be right. I wish it would pop up the emulator for me. Is that right? A, B, C times plus D minus? All right. Um, let's give ourselves uh, the other example too, just make sure it's doing both of them. I think we have, let's take this input, even though it's gonna be useless for me copying that. So three plus four times two, Oh, I can. Yeah, thank you. Star for the day. All right, and I think we handle spaces with trims, right? So this shouldn't be a problem. hasn't actually run yet. It said it ran, but I don't think it ran. All right, that looks like it ran now. Okay. So there's our output. Somebody have the output up? Three, four, two, times one, five, minus two. Okay, yeah, uh, that's that's not looking right. Oh yeah, why are there parentheses in there? We must be handling. So we're pushing. I mean, this that means this guy made it onto our output stack for starters. So how did that guy make it onto our output stack? There's our opening parenthesis. Yeah, here's our op priority. It has to be something with our op priority. Oh, we weren't adding stuff on top of the parenthesis. We burned that opening parenthesis off um, because that opening parenthesis returned a four on this guy. So when we're asking if we should burn, we we need to make this a little bit more robust. We have to say, if the stack's not empty, and this dot op stack dot peak is not equal to, well, it's actually this, uh, dot equals opening parenthesis, I'll put a not in front of that, Okay, so while it's not empty, and the top of the stack's not the opening parenthesis, and the op priority is right. Because our else uh, return value for the op priority was giving the open parenthesis a pretty high priority. Let's give it a priority of four. Which was causing us to burn it over to our output. All right, three, four, two times one, five, uh, minus, looks like we have a space in there. That's probably on our, then two, three, power, power, divide plus. We've got two power, power, three, divide plus. Okay. Yeah, there's some spacing things there, so that's gonna be in our split. Actually, here, we can test that real quick just to see if that's where the problem is. Let's just take our, well, we'll do it out here or in here. 
Check the spaces out. And then we can choose to ignore empty strings in our code if this ends up being a fix. All right. Oh no, we still have empty dudes in there. Yeah, let's make sure that this actually ran. It looks like it did because the spaces are gone, but it might be we can't tell spaces in that text field. Okay. 342 times 15 minus 23 power power. Divide plus. No, three is before the powers. I mean after the powers. After the powers. Let's yeah, let's look at this guy. So so mine's right? Yeah. Okay. Alright. So that looks like it's so we'll assume we've exhaustedly checked all possible formulas we could ever pass it. <laughs> with those two. <laughs> All right. Okay, so now, finally, we want to actually do the math for this guy. All right, so the math should be relatively easy for us to handle now that we know our... Uh, um, do we know what the output math should be for that one? We could do it for the other one. The other one's a little friendlier. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and we're going to create a function in shunting yard. Let me take this breakpoint out of here. There we go. And let's call this guy private um, string do math. All right, and this guy is going to take a linked list of string because that's what that guy is right our oh there it's actually uh, global so it's going to be our output queue is already a linked list okay so we don't need to take it as a parameter because we already have access to it so we'll tell him to do the math and ultimately return a string so we're going to go ahead and do the math uh, numerically right we know that the very first element of our uh, output queue will be a number, right? It would not have got, we, we never would have added, or, or the input was like not legal. All right, so we'll know that it'll be a number. So we can immediately burn uh, the very first value. Um, so we'll go int num2. Well, here, let's create an int num1 and an int num2. But just as a quick example here to show you, we're going to end up putting it into num2. So if we go up here to this guy, um, actually, let's go back to this example. We know this is going to be 8. We'll put this into our code so we can walk through it and see how this ultimately will work. And uh, we'll just return the empty string for right now so he's happy. Okay, so as we're walking through this guy, we're going to have um, four, then two, then three. And then we hit the multiplication. Uh, and the multiplication is kind of a bad example. So when we look at our original thing here, we know we're doing 2 times 3, correct? So uh, when we hit that multiplication, the right-hand guy is the top of our output stack, or top of our math stack. The input guy, or the, 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 the left-hand guy, is going to be the guy, uh, the, the second thing. We have to pop twice to get to that. 
So we're going to actually store this guy in a stack. So we'll push a four, then we'll push a two on top of that, then we'll push a three on top of that. When we hit an operator, then we go ahead and um, uh, we go ahead and pop. That's our right hand op uh, operand, and then pop again. That's our left hand operand, and then apply the operator to those two guys. Okay, but we apply in that order. So the top guy of the stack is going to be the second number, the right hand operand. The second pop will be the left hand operand. So let's give ourselves another thing here called private apply op. And this guy will take in an int num1, an int num2, and a string op, since our ops are in string format. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to say if op.equals a plus, and this guy's going to return an int, we will return num1 plus num2. Else if op is equal to a minus, and this is where it would have been important, the order of operation, num1 minus num2. And this isn't necessarily the fix yet because we need to make sure we pass the proper num1 and num2 in here. Else if it's multiplication, won't matter in that case. Else if it's division, will matter in that case. And um, I think for ours, we can assume we're doing integer division. But you know, otherwise, we would want to take these in as doubles, and then we get better values. But this at least is the proof of concept. Uh, and then last is, we're not doing, do we do modulo? No, just power, right? Power, <laughs> so we'll say math dot pow and we'll pass this guy the um, num1 num2 we need to convert its output to an int All right uh, and we'll just do that as our else actually so we can call it a day alright so math.pow actually returns a double so this takes this number to this power. Okay. So let's go ahead down to do math. So do math is going to, num1 and num2 are for those guys, and we're going to, we'll use them to stage it. Um, so we're going to need a stack. So we'll call this guy uh, a stack of... Mm, We'll say a stack of strings. That'll be the easiest to do. We'll call this guy the math stack. This is going to be a new stack of string. Okay, and we're going to uh, keep uh, going through our uh, output to Q until it's empty. So for, um, let's see, we'll just say for string S in this dot output queue. So this will go through every element of output queue. Uh, what are we going to do? We are going to uh, look at the current s. So if this dot is op s, then we actually do math stuff, right? So we'll say num2 is equal to uh, math stack dot pop. So that's going to come out as a string. So we'll do an integer dot parse int on that string. Num1 will equal the same exact thing. And then s is our op. So now we can go ahead and we can say uh, math stack dot push empty string concatenated with this dot apply op num1, num2, and s. So that'll push it back onto the stack.
Okay, so we're going to do that for every single thing that is in our stack. Finally, we're going to return integer dot parse int uh, math stack dot pop. That's where our final answer is going to be. Uh, oh, this guy's returning a string. So we don't need to do the uh, integer dot parse int on it. All right, so just to show you kind of how that works. If we have our four, two, three, so this guy, pop up this notepad here. So our output is four, two, three times plus two minus. And we know we should get an eight out of this, right? So here's our stack. So we hit a number, we push it onto the stack. We hit another number, we push that onto the stack. We hit another number, we push that onto the stack. We hit multiplication. Multiplication says grab our three and two, multiply them together, giving us a six, push it back onto the stack. Then we hit the plus. Plus says, um, so here's our stack. So we're going to take num two, num one, when we do pop, pop, right? So our stack goes empty. So that's going to be four for num one, six for num two, plus sign for the operator. That's going to give us a 10, push it back onto the stack. Then we're going to hit the two, push that onto the stack. Then we're going to hit the minus. Minus says consume the stack. This is num two. This is num one. So 10 minus two is going to be eight. Push the answer back onto the stack. Now we've burned through everything on our um, input, or our output queue rather, and our final answer is the one element left on our stack. So now we just have to pop that answer and return it. Make sense? So down here in get answer, rather than building this guy, We're going to go ahead and return this dot do math. So everything above this uh, stages our our elements in postfix order or in prefix order, and then when we do math, it goes through and processes it. So we should get an eight out of this guy, I believe. That's the current input we have in there. Row. All right. Well, possibly not. No, I didn't. I just did if it's an op. Gets seventy five percent. A little late for the test, but. <laughs> All right. So math stack dot push s right. So whenever we have something that's uh, not an op, op say do something. Not an op says just throw it on the stack. There's our eight. All right. And then does it tell us what the answer should the, for the other guy should be? Just to make sure we're doing our thing so I don't have to do math in my head. Oh, is it like a decimal point number? Oh, well, it can't be that bad. Let's see. Two times one is two. Well, here, let's just take it, we'll process it. All right, so three onto the stack, four onto the stack, two onto the stack, consume the stack, two times four is eight, push it back onto the stack, one onto the stack, five onto the stack, minus, so this should be one minus, uh, five. So that should give us a negative four back on the stack. Um, then two on the stack, then three on the stack, then 
power, so this should be 2 to the third power, which is 8. So we'll consume that, push 8 back on the stack, then we hit another power. Eey, eey. So this is going to be negative 4 to the eighth power. Um, so negative 4 times negative 4 is 16, times negative 4 is negative 64, times negative 4 is 128, 256. Did I do that right? But no, I didn't. I didn't do it enough times. Yeah. Negative 4 to the 8th power. Negative 65,536. See, perfect. All in my head. Negative 65,536 should be a meaningful number. Take the minus off of it. What is that, what is that number? Yeah, to the 16th power. So... Um, so that's, uh, that's the size of a short, plus or minus 65,535, or plus or, plus or minus uh, zero, negative 65,536 to positive 65,535 is the, the range. No, short is negative 32,000. This is the negative of maximum value of char. That's what it would be. All right, so then we hit the divide. So that's eight to e, e, e. <laughs> this thing's eight divided by that guy. Is uh sixty five thousand. Oh, it's eight divided by negative Copy. Push that back on there. Plus three. <laughs> yeah. Um, but we could probably, so this should be a plus three, should be that plus three. I can just do that real quick. So 2.9998, that should be our final answer. We can convert it to make it work pretty quick just for the sake of awesomeness. Okay, so, and then it'll work for everything. We'll just get decimal numbers. It'd be like something point zero. Okay, so for do math, this will be a double, this will be a double, this will be parse double. Be parse double. What's it upset about? Oh, <laughs> it's just I'm just using the wrong function is the problem. So it's double dot parse double, and this is double dot parse double. New toolbox stuff. All right, so. Uh, and then for apply op, we need to have that guy take in two doubles. Double, double. Ultimately returning a double, which we then concatenate onto the empty string, so that should be fine. Okay, I think that should. Uh, yeah, for the power, thank you. Just the very last one up here. All right. That should do it. And that would have definitely impacted our output here. We need our input string from... See, wouldn't it be nice if Keynote worked like that? All right, so this should give us positive 2.99-ish. I would say with rounding errors, that's probably right. Could be. Oh, oh, wait a minute. Well, 
Well, unless we did our math wrong. So what was it? Negative four. Here, I bet you. I bet you. Yeah. Yeah, because it came out to negative sixty-five thousand before. All right. So I think our answer is right here. And I think we should then be able to, if I do uh, undo. Oh, I wanna. I wanna. Oh wait, it's not undo. It's redo. Redo. Redo, redo, boom. All right, so we should get 8.0 here, I believe. I wonder why it only reloads sometimes. No changes to deploy, do I have to, do I have to save it? I don't think so, but I, I did. Okay, we'll kill it and then run it again. Right. And there's our 8.0. All right, so now it should work for everything with all those symbols in it. Awesome. So let me push the final version of that. Working, shunting, yard, four decimals. All right, commit and push. Commit. All right, so the reason I didn't give you that part for your homework is that would have been too easy. The bloom filters are an absolute nightmare. Um, is that good? Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't that encourage you to go to the hackathon. Right, so, uh, actually, bloom filters aren't that aren't that bad. Uh, so the premise was what's this? How many of you were leaning towards going to the hackathon now instead of the homework assignment? One and a half people. Right, so. Uh, all right, so here's the idea for uh, bloom filters. Sometimes we have really, really, really large data sets. All right, so there's a kind of a field in computer science uh, known as big data. So we have gigantic data sets, and we want to know if a certain element is a member of a gigantic data set. Now, for the assignment, you're going to be testing this on small data sets because we don't have gigantic data sets. But the idea is that we can either exhaustively search a data set. And we've talked about some searching algorithms, uh, uh, 250, like binary search, where we just keep dividing it in half over and over and over again. But, um, uh, and then binary trees effectively work that way, right? As we go through a, a binary tree, we just... We pick the branch where it's going to be and then move on with uh, then keep checking so we keep having our data effectively. Well, the idea here is instead of exhaustively searching our data, we can instead determine whether our data is likely, uh, whether the thing we're searching for is likely in our data. Make sense? Okay. Not foolproof, has a small percentage uh, error uh, if, if we do it right, um, but as long as you're not like making life and death decisions uh, on the data, a pretty good guess might be good enough. Okay, so you know, for instance, if uh, you're doing something with, uh, you know, I don't know, controlling air conditioning or something like that, based on uh, I don't know, temperature outside, uh, you know, if you sometimes increase the value or you sometimes don't increase the value, this isn't life and death. You know, if you get one false positive or one false negative. You know, one to, you know, one little click, if it's checking it every 15 minutes, it's probably not a, uh, a big deal. Okay, so this guy is a space-efficient, probabilistic data structure conceived by this dude, hence the balloon filter thing, in 1970. Okay, test whether an element is a member of a set. Um, like I mentioned, false positives are possible, false negatives are not. Okay, so uh, we would never, um, oh, they're not, actually they're not because of the way we map this stuff in, but false positives are certainly possible. Um, so if we scroll down here, we get an example of this. So, so the idea is that as our data comes in, 
so if we have uh, uh, the set X, Y, Z, uh, color error shows the position in a bit array. That So a bit array is just an array filled up with zeros and ones. All right. So and we place bits based on this algorithm and we'll see how that works in a second. OK, so bloom filter is a bit array of M bits all set to zero initially. Then we turn certain ones on as we go through it. Uh, there must also be K different what are called hash functions. OK, so let's talk about hash functions for a second. <laughs> you see that question? <laughs> you gotta, have we talked about that in here or you heard about it in a different class or you just know what it is? Because I learned about it recently for my 450 class, what Netflix and chill means. Yeah. See, I didn't. Really? What are you thinking it was? I, I don't know. Watch Netflix and chill. Apparently it means something different than that. I don't know, so I'm, I'm old. The, um, I had one student who said he likes to be old school, and he said VHS and something else. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. I'll give you one guess who that student was. Which you may not have. I think you've had class with them. You've had class with Haxton? Dave Haxton? Yeah. yeah. Anybody who's had class with him would have gotten it on the first guess. <laughs> um, all right, see. This is us. All right, so hash algorithms. Or hash function. All right, have we heard about these before? Okay, what is a hash function? Heard of them? Don't necessarily know what they are? Okay. Um, anybody want to take a guess? What are they do with corned beef hash? I mean, I like it when they're... I don't want the potatoes that diced, right? <laughs> so a hash function is, what, is what's called a one-way cipher. So, um, cipher. You maybe heard about the security class? Is that where you heard about it? Okay, so it's a one-way cipher. So it takes an arbitrary size input. Anybody thinking about the hackathon now? Because you have to write K numbers of these. All right, arbitrary size input, which produces a fixed size output. Okay, that is to say, you can feed it a gigabyte of data. So if you have a hash function that produces a 64-bit output, you can feed it a gigabyte of data, and it would boil that down to 64 bits. You could feed it three bits of data and it would boil that down to 64 bits. Make sense? All right, so hash functions are uh, one-way ciphers, arbitrary size input, fixed size output. So with that in mind, what is an obvious weakness of hash functions? If you can literally feed it an infinite number of inputs, an infinite different inputs, but there's a fixed size output. So in a 64-bit output, output, how many uh, unique outputs are there? So 64-bit output, what is the number of unique outputs? to the 64th, right? So 64, this is why we need to have a higher math requirement. <laughs> well, I did. You, could, I do, you couldn't do that in your head? <laughs> it's not 12. <laughs> <laughs> Two to the 64th. I'm sure this is a scientific notation. Yeah, 1.84 times 10 to the 19th. All right. So a lot of outputs, right? A lot of outputs, but not an infinite number, right? It's close to infinity, but not infinity, right? Ish. It's not as close to infinity as 2 to the 128th for 128-bit output, okay? Or a gigabit output, 1,024 bits. That's a lot, but not infinite. <laughs> All right, but this guy can literally take in an infinite number of inputs. You can feed it any size input, okay? and it gives you a fixed size output. So because of that, what is the weakness of a hash function? Yeah. 
Is it possible for me to feed it two different inputs and get the same output? Yeah. So, somebody waving at me. I'm just like, <laughs> okay. It's possible, right? So if we had two different inputs, they could both potentially produce the same 64-bit output. This is a fixed size output. We maybe reach that output in a different way, but this is called collisions. Suffer from collisions. You, I, you had to have talked about that in your security class. Yeah. Because you probably talked about this in terms of MD5, right? Yeah. Okay, so um, you had to talk about collisions. That's MD5's thing. Okay, so uh, a famous... Uh, uh, hash function is something called MD5. That's this message digest five. And this guy's claim to fame, you know, kind of like Java's claim to fame is platform independence. This guy's claim to fame would be collision resistance slash avoidance. Avoidance? Nailed it. All right. That's, that's MD5's thing. All right. It's not that collisions can't happen, but they are gen generally not found. Okay. You seriously didn't talk about collisions? Who in here has had the security class? Okay. But you didn't even know what it meant. It was just on the quiz. Yeah. So in his mind, he talked about it, whether or not it actually happened or not. Okay, I got it. I get it. Yeah, because that's that's MD5's thing. What's MD5 used for while we're on the subject? It says we need some review from the security class. Yeah. It's actually not even the security thing it's typically used for. Like checking if there's added, like added malware to a download or something. Yeah. Like yeah. It's usually validating a download, right? Yeah. So a lot of times if you download some big big file, a four four or five gigabyte file, they'll uh, include with it on the website sometimes the MD5 hash so that after you've downloaded it, you can run it against MD5 and compare the hashes. You know, is what you got likely what they were giving <laughs> is the, the idea. Keeping in mind that it's possible if you got the, I don't know, the, the, the right uh, alcoholic mix of a virus <laughs> that it could potentially produce a uh, mimicked MD5. That would actually be a really fascinating virus. If somebody wrote a virus specifically that, that made the, the necessary changes to uh, an input file, a, you know, a three gigabyte or four gigabyte file that produced an identical hash, even though it now had the virus in it, that would be very difficult to do with MD5 because it's collision resistant. It would be difficult to, to discover that, but that would be interesting. The chances are the amount of time it would take to do that might be, the software might be antiquated by, by then. But still a thing. All right, so MD5 is an example of a hash. We're going to call this guy a pretty legit hash. All right, we will not be using legit hashes. What's up? Oh, uh, no? Yeah, it's on my boat. Yeah, I'll bring it. All right, thanks. Yep. So we're not going to be using legit hashes for our code. We're going to be using made-up uh, joke hashes. <laughs> we just uh, we have to apply some sort of mathematical formula to everything that comes in. So, for instance, if you have a, um, but you have to apply it consistently. So maybe uh, anything that comes in, you convert it into uh, um, uh, zeros. You, know, you you convert it into numbers, and then you add three to every number, something like that, and then you convert it into binary. So joke hashes, things that have nothing to do with math, like real math, just add something or subtract something to it, and you're applying it to every single thing. Um, that should be okay, rel reasonably speaking, with uh, bloom filters, because bloom filters really aren't based on the strength of the hash, all right, because they use some number of hashes. So there must also be k different hash functions. So for you, you can have a hash function that adds one to every uh, number, adds two to every number, adds three to every number, so on and so forth. Um, each of which maps or hashes some set element to one of the M array positions uh, uniformly. So here's our M array positions, all right? We're going to apply K number of hash functions, and we'll look at that here in a second, okay, to our input. 
and that's going to ultimately produce ones in, in, in various buckets. Okay? Typically, K is a constant, much smaller than M. So for us, you might choose a K that's like 2 or 3 or 4, you know, a relatively small number of, of hash functions because we're similar to the shunting yard. We're trying to get a proof of concept for this guy. Uh, so much smaller than M, which is proportional to the number of elements to be added. Uh, so that is to say the more inputs that we have, the more hash functions you're going to want to use to bump uh, the, the, well, reduce the probability of false positives. Okay. Um, uh, to add an element to our list, okay, so we're not actually adding the elements. What we're, you know, you'll add the element to your giant data source. You have a, a billion elements over here. Then what you'll do is you'll feed the element into your boom filter, and it effectively records uh, that element's likelihood, if you will, to our bloom filter. Because we're going to use the bloom filter itself to determine if our element is uh, uh, likely, the element somebody's searching for is likely in our data set. Okay, so to add an element, feed it into each of our k hash functions. So maybe you have three hash functions that you've made up uh, to get k array positions. All right, uh, set the bit at all of these positions to one. So your output of your hash functions is going to give us some number of, uh, you know, if you have four output functions and each one of them gives you a number between 0 and m, that's your, that's your size of your hash, you'll put a 1 for each of the four hash functions at the appropriate bucket in the array. Make sense? All right, so that's what it'll do. It's basically just going to fill the array with 1s in in our case, four places, if you're using four hash functions. Uh, here, they're given the example of three, so maybe you choose M is 18 and K is three. Fair enough, just use the same example from here. Okay, so you can read through the rest of this as to the uh, um, you know, probability of false positives and, and things like that, but for your homework assignment, we're just going to mimic this top part here where you're going to create an array. So, you know, add, create a linked list that you add 10 elements to or something like that. You can have your, uh, uh, your text box that reads something in, a button that just adds it to your array, and then build your bloom filter. So we should see the bloom filter up top, maybe just as a string, if you would. Um, you could even do it at the text line or the, the output uh, that starts building it up every single time it changes. So in the end, you have that final bloom filter. So for the homework assignment, all we're doing is building the bloom filter. We're not going to use it. We're not going to use it to determine whether something's in our set, but we're going to use it to build something that looks like this. Okay? And go ahead and make your bit element your bit array 18 bits, so a bucket, so an 18 bucket integer array that you happen to only put zeros and ones in. Okay? That's what that guy will be. And then invent three different hash functions. I would suggest the hash function, and it must give a number between 0 and 17 as the output. All right? So do modding or whatever you want. But in the end, the output of it should be 0 to 17. Pick your poison, three hash functions, make them as dumb as you want, but they need to be consistent. No matter what you pass it, it gives you a number between 0 and 17. Make sense? All right. So homework is produce... Let's call it a ghetto bloom filter for Tuesday. All right? Or sign up for the hackathon and uh, make sure you let me know when you sign up and whether or not you need a ride. We'll be leaving campus at 820. Uh, otherwise, you could just meet us down there. But let me know so I can get you assigned to a team. I will see everybody on Tuesday.